To put it simply, Gabe is an idealist that'll never understand my perspective. His loyalty only goes as far as his little group of friends. Lena is naive. Beth's insistence on shielding her from the harsh realities of life only serve to ensure that she'll always be dependent upon others in order to survive. Priscilla is perhaps the most loyal of them all, but she is loyal only because she fears the wider galaxy, not because she understands my wider ideals. And Beth, she may very well be the most dangerous of them all. I believe she has the power to either pull us out of the hole in the ground we found ourselves in, or bury us forever. Beth idled in the kitchen of their shared farmhouse. Eferia's red dwarf was slowly setting over the horizon. Beth had informed Gabe and Priscilla of the plan and urged them to pack their things and be ready in the very early hours of the morning. Her and Lena had already managed to pack everything that mattered to them. Well, almost everything. Beth looked on as Lena had a mental battle with herself in the living room. Right at the foot of the stairs sat a small coffee table. A strange reflective piece of metal proudly sat atop it, as if it were some fancy collector's item. Lena stared at it, studying her own reflection. It was as if the world around her had vanished, and only the object remained. You gonna stare at that thing all day? Beth asked, breaking Lena out of her stupor. Lena blinked a few times, as if to readjust herself. Sorry, it's being awfully chatty today. The object in question was itself a Lokdeng artifact, an item infused with psionic energy, or so Lena claimed. According to her, it would whisper on occasion, attempting to communicate with her via the psionic network. What the artifact actually was could have been anyone's guess. Unlike the other artifacts on Eferia, this one held a certain amount of sentimental value. It belonged to Lena's parents. Her father, Burke, had found it in the area and decided that it was a sign to settle on this land. Little did he know that this planet would be the death of him and his wife. The artifact held a complicated place in Lena's heart. On one hand, it was the only real memento she had of her parents. On the other, it was the reason she was psionically gifted in the first place. It was laced with a rare element called Sinium. Exposure to this element was what awakened psionic potential in genetically predisposed humans like Lena. It was that same psionic potential that drew the attention of the Alliance. Their Psy Ops program demanded the kidnapping and training of psionic children in order to combat the threat of the Lokdang. A few Alliance representatives showed up at Lena's home and informed her parents that they would be taking their child. Naturally, her parents were furious. They ranted and raved about how the Alliance wouldn't do anything about the pirate gangs on Eferia, but they would gladly just waltz on over and take away their children. Unfortunately, Eferia was low on the Alliance's list of priorities, even back then. It was that same neglect that would lead to the untimely deaths of Burke and Faye Weiss. Eferia was a lot more unorderly back in those days. The Zakaras were still in full swing, which meant that the Fractured hadn't even been formed yet. Etheria bordered the Trinima systems, which meant it was a cesspit of gang activity. Turf wars were a common occurrence in every major settlement. So when these gangs caught wind of an alliance crew walking around on their planet, they naturally took it as an act of aggression. And how was a pirate gang supposed to respond to such an act? By killing the alliance stooges on their turf, of course. And that's exactly what they did. Faye and Burke were just unlucky enough to be caught in the crossfire. In the end, 
it was really just a misunderstanding that got them killed. The Alliance were only interested in Lena. Had the pirates not been so quick to protect their turf, things could have turned out very differently for Lena and her parents. Granted, it was difficult to say which outcome was preferable, and all that history was packed into that reflective piece of metal sitting at the foot of their stairs, like some decorative centerpiece. It's been like this ever since I found the sphere. That's weird. You think maybe they're related somehow? Well, if they're both connected to the psionic network, then they must be. But I didn't know that Lockdang artifacts could talk to each other. Or whatever the heck it's doing. I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to look into it when we're settled in on Adamo. Beth tried to say it reassuringly, but she noticed that Lena had faltered a bit. You are taking it with you, aren't you? Lena just stared at her reflection in the artifact. There's a lot of baggage with this thing. Beth understood. Hell, she wouldn't be surprised if Lena somehow found a way to blame this thing for the death of her parents. But that didn't mean that she had to abandon it altogether. I know it holds a lot of bad memories, but that's not all it is, right? It meant something more to you once upon a time. Lena's lips curved into a small smile as she stared at the artifact reminiscently. I was always so enthralled by it. It was the most interesting thing in the world to me. Like it was a glimpse at all the mysteries and secrets in the galaxy just waiting to be discovered. Maybe that's the part that's still worth holding on to, your sense of adventure. Your desire to delve into the unknown. You can leave all the other stuff behind without abandoning the artifact, too. Beth. Lena snorted. I'm blown away at how sappy that was. Beth rolled her eyes. Oh, shut up. I'm serious. That was like off the charts for what I thought was possible for you. Beth gave her friend a playful shove. I'm trying to make you feel better, you ass. Lena chuckled. Well, it worked. She reached down and picked up the artifact. And you've convinced me to take this fella along with us. Well, thank God we got that settled. A few moments passed before the quiet was interrupted by a knock at the door. Beth was able to make out a broad figure on the other side of the window. She maneuvered her way over and opened it to be greeted by Gabe, holding a glass bottle of some type of alcohol in his hand. Beth regarded him with a raised eyebrow. Evening. He greeted as he raised the bottle for her to see the label. Mind if I come in? Beth tilted her head. I don't mind, but did you really come all the way out here just to share a drink? Gabe scoffed. I'll have you know, this is Bregian brandy that I had imported, all the way from Zyobir. And if now isn't the time for a celebratory drink, then I don't know what is. I would have waited until after we got off-world, but that's just me. Well, I actually bought it as a birthday gift for you, but then it got delayed for a couple of weeks, so now it's sort of a mix of a birthday gift and a goodbye Afaria celebration. You bought it for... oh. Gabe nodded. It's the same kind Tix had that one time. You said you were a fan of it, so I figured... Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. She stammered through her words, overwhelmed by the unexpected thoughtfulness. Uh, come in, let's share it. She stepped out of the doorway to allow Gabe to enter, making sure to close the door behind him. The two of them made their way to the kitchen where Lena gave him a friendly greeting. She had obviously heard the exchange from where she was, if the three glasses already sitting on the table were any indication. Beth looked at her curiously. Three glasses? Is Miss Lightweight actually going to share a drink with us? Lena rolled her eyes. Just pour me a little bit. I'd like to at least pretend that I'm joining in. Beth chuckled and motioned for Gabe to do as she requested. Soon, three snifter glasses were filled with brandy and clinked together. The trio all downed their shots at the same time. Beth and Gabe both quickly looked at Lena to gauge her reaction. Her face was a bit hard to read, as if she was debating whether it was a pleasant experience or not. Don't think too hard. It's not great, but it's better than that whiskey I tried. So, you're still a lightweight then? Still a lightweight. Lena nodded as she pushed the glass away. You know, Priscilla should really be here too. I tried inviting her, but she really didn't feel like going anywhere tonight. How's she doing? This whole thing's really stressing her out. I wish there was more I could do for her. Me too. It's not like her to get so paranoid. It's probably just bringing up bad memories. Her dad's shuttle was shot down by one of those old Alliance defense towers when she was a kid. Lena nodded. I lost my parents the same way. Granted, we were actually on the shuttle too when it was shot down. It's still a miracle we survived. I still don't know which gang it was that shot us down. Logan had his people deal with them and we kind of just left it at that. It could have been the same ones Priscilla had to deal with. Slavers took her mom off-world right before her dad died. As far as she's concerned, any attempt to get away from Afaria is a death sentence. Funny, I feel like staying is an even worse sentence. 
Speaking of those defense towers, one of those is still operational. Is that going to be a problem? Gabe shook his head. That war yen you met was cleared to enter and leave. Logan thinks he's just delivering a few shipments from outside the system. I sure as hell hope so. It still won't be enough to calm Priscilla's nerves. Her and I will head over to the shuttle port together. I'll try to keep her as relaxed as possible on the walkover. The two of you are free to stay the night, if you'd like. Thanks, but I've been scheduled to patrol the western warehouses tonight. No sleep for me. I told Priscilla I'd head over to her place as soon as I rotate shifts. Damn, you haven't been put on night shift in a while. Yeah, hell of a send-off to this place. I'll be glad to finally be rid of it. Well, by this time tomorrow it'll be well behind us. I heard that the capital city of Libertalia is a massive cultural hub. It sounds like it'll get a huge influx of tourism within the next few years. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the fairgrounds. Gabe fixed Beth with a knowing look. You'll have a chance to actually have some fun for once. Beth raised an eyebrow. You saying I don't know how to have fun, Mr. Russo? The fact that you just called me Mr. Russo says it all, Miss Meyer. Oh, was that hypocrisy I just detected? No, but I believe I just detected a deflection. Lena chuckled as she threw up her hands. Okay, you two deserve some privacy. I'm turning in early for tonight. She stood up and made her way to the stairs. Good night, Gabe. Have fun on your last patrol ever. Gabe gave her a half-hearted two-finger salute. See you in the morning, Lena. And with that, Lena disappeared to the second floor, where her footsteps traveled in the direction of her room. The mood between Gabe and Beth took a bit of an awkward shift. So, the reason I brought up the fairgrounds is because I thought maybe you'd be interested in checking out the sights of Libertalia, as in just the two of us. Wait, are you serious? Beth responded a little more hopefully than she meant to. Gabe nodded. Yes, yeah, I, I'd like that. They both chuckled at the absurdity of their sudden awkwardness. Their interest in one another had never gone unnoticed before, but now that the possibility of something more was actually staring her in the face, she couldn't help but feel a bit of juvenile giddiness. Sorry to tell you this, but your face is looking several shades redder. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. She laughed as she rubbed her face. Well, this just took an embarrassing turn. Oh, so you're embarrassed at the fact you find me so charming. Keep stroking your ego, Russo. I've got plenty of time to back out. Damn. Guess I better shut my mouth then. Giving up that easily? I thought you'd put your foot down. Trying to goad me into being more assertive? I thought you'd be more direct about what you wanted. Beth scoffed. Fair enough. But in all seriousness, I'm looking forward to seeing Libertalia. And, um, what about your uncle? He asked carefully. Beth paused in place. She honestly hadn't given it much thought, which probably sounded strange. She'd actually never even met Lucas before. Her connection to him didn't extend past the fact that he was her mom's brother. All of her knowledge of him was secondhand. The basic outline was that at one point he had been an Alliance Marine until he eventually became a privateer. He was actually a part of the privateer army that kicked the Zakiras and Ligans out of the Trinima systems. After the Trinima systems were in the hands of the Alliance, Lucas left with the privateers to help establish Libertalia. And now he was the curator of his own Museum of Galactic History. It was privately funded, apparently. Lucas must have amassed a small fortune at some point in his life, unless he has a very wealthy backer funding the whole thing. Whichever it was, Beth had no idea. She finally released a sigh. Honestly? I don't have a damn clue. I mean, I guess I'm hoping for a warm reception, like reuniting with Lucas is going to, I don't know, restore what was lost in my life, if that makes any sense. Gabe nodded. I get it. If I had an opportunity to restore what was lost, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Beth felt a sudden wave of guilt wash over her. According to Gabe, his dad had turned into a vindictive bastard after his mom was killed in a turf war. He found her killer drinking in a bar on the other side of town, and lost one of his eyes in the fight that ensued. He still managed to kill the guy, but a week later he was beaten to death in the streets as a means of retaliation. And here she was, wallowing in self-pity over the fact that she didn't have a real relationship with her uncle who was still alive and well. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Gabe waved her off. Don't apologize, I was being sincere. I guess it's just strange being the only one with any surviving family. Ever think of tracking down your mom? I'm sure she's still on Kyria, working the Cinium mines. Whether or not I'm ready to see her again is a matter of debate. Do you blame her for what happened? You know, it's the funniest thing. I don't know. I know I shouldn't. It wasn't her fault. An Alliance representative showed up one night and told her he'd be taking me away the next morning. What was she supposed to do? 
Leave? She was barely able to support the both of us with the job she already had. Going on the run would have probably gotten us both killed. But you still seem bitter about it. I'm nowhere near as bitter as I used to be. I spent almost a year in that Alliance facility. Most days I just sat around meditating in the presence of a psionic beacon, just crossing my fingers that my psionic potential would finally... unlock. Or whatever the proper term is for it. It's strange to think about how that's the thing that made me an outcast. How the kids who could manipulate and weaponize psionic energy were the normal ones. I didn't really have anyone I could rely on for the longest time. It made me angry. I lashed out at everything I could. Wanted to take it all out on anyone who didn't have the power to stop me. Beth shook her head, disappointed and ashamed of her childhood self. You were a kid. Life was hard and confusing. Unfair. It's only natural that you were angry about it. Trust me, I was more than angry. I was spiteful, insecure. I wanted to hurt people just to make myself feel better about my own suffering. That's clearly not who you are. Sometimes I'm not so sure. Did you know it was actually Mike that changed my perspective on things? He steered me away from a self-destructive path. He was a great man in a lot of ways. You think so? In spite of everything he did? Beth nodded. Mike was a privateer like Lucas. Her time with the PsyOps program revealed that she was in fact psionically gifted, but not like the other kids. She couldn't manipulate psionic energy or interact with Lockdang technology or even connect to a psionic network. But what she could do was sense, for lack of a better term, when somebody else was psionically gifted. Since she was basically useless as a Psy soldier, the Alliance decided that her unique talents would be better put to use by sending her to frontier colonies to sniff out psionically gifted children. The irony wasn't lost on her that now she was the one helping rip children away from their families to serve as experimental soldiers against a foe far stronger than them. During this time, Beth's entourage was a group of privateers who transported her from planet to planet and town to town. Most of them tried to avoid building any kind of personal connection to her. She never even got to see their faces. They were always hidden behind the tinted visors of their helmets. All except for one. The leader of their little group held a soft spot for the young girl. He seemed to be the first person in her life that had actually taken an interest in getting to know her. He asked about her family, her home life, her interests, the things she liked to do. Beth was pretty cold towards him at first partially because she had no interest in sharing anything about herself, but also because there weren't a whole lot of satisfying answers to his questions. Beth lived a pretty isolated life. Her mother would leave to work in the mines around the same time Beth would leave for school. She would be at work until late in the evening, so most nights Beth was home alone. She had to learn to look after herself. Most nights her mother would come home to find that Beth was the one who had made dinner for her. The two of them never really acknowledged the situation, but Beth could see the perpetual look of guilt that adorned her mother's features. In a lot of ways, she probably felt like she was failing her daughter. Having her taken away by the Alliance was just the final nail in the coffin. Beth hadn't spoken to her mother since she was taken over ten years ago. The shuttle crash that killed Lena's parents also killed Mike and his entire crew. A 13-year-old Beth and a 9-year-old Lena were the only survivors. Naturally, Logan did everything in his power to ensure no one ever discovered that little bit of sensitive information. He gathered up all of the orphans on Epharia he could before making it his personal mission to clean up the rest of the gangs on the planet. He thought he could turn kids like Beth into his own personal army. Loyal followers and soldiers groomed since childhood to help him create his own federation of independent systems standing up against the Alliance. It probably would have worked too if he wasn't such a ruthless psychopath. Him and Beth were actually fairly aligned ideologically, but he went too far in her eyes. Maybe that was just youthful optimism clouding her judgment. Maybe cynicism simply came with age and Logan reflected her inevitable future self. An interesting theory, but one she wasn't convinced of. As it stood, she wasn't all that interested in some kind of radical political change. Right now, her only concern was giving her friends the best lives she possibly could. And the best way to do that was by getting away from Eferia. I don't want to believe that we're defined by our most egregious actions. There has to be some road to redemption, right? For some of us? Sure. 
I don't know if that can be applied to everyone, though. I guess not. I don't think Mike believed he could justify himself, but I do think he wanted to show me everything that was good in life. Maybe he thought he could find some kind of redemption through me. Sometimes I felt like he wanted to preserve any amount of my innocence that he could. Sounds familiar. Beth faltered a moment before downing her entire glass of brandy. She released a sigh. I don't like a lot of the things I've done, that any of us have done, but I did it all for her. I want... I need her to be better than I was. That line of thinking doesn't have to end with her. It's a fresh start for all of us. A chance to be better than we were. Is it too late, though? The damage is already done. We can't change the things we did, but we can still move forward and try to make things better. Maybe that redeems us. Maybe it doesn't. It'll never be perfect, but maybe if we try, we'll find that better is good enough. Gabe poured her another glass. Beth hummed thoughtfully. Well... She reached for the glass and raised it in a half-hearted toast. Here's to good enough. Gabe raised his glass alongside hers. Good enough. They both emptied their glasses. Gabe took a quick peek at his Vic to check the time. You need to head out soon? I should head out now if I'm being honest. Okay. Beth pushed the bottle of brandy towards Gabe. You should give some of this to Priscilla when you stop by her place in the morning. It might help calm her nerves a bit. You sure? Yeah, I think she'll appreciate it. It might be a bit early to be getting her buzzed, but it's a thoughtful enough gesture. He grabbed the bottle as he stood from his chair. Beth stood as well and saw him out. The two of them said their farewells, though it wasn't the casual gesture it seemed to be. There was an unspoken depth behind their simple words. The knowing looks they gave one another carried a heavy weight, an acknowledgement that they were so close to the end and the implications that came along with it. They both silently gave each other the same message. Be, Be careful. careful. And the two of them parted ways. Beth watched Gabe disappear into the nighttime horizon. A chill went down her spine, but she wasn't sure if it was the cool breeze in the air or something more sinister lurking beyond her purview. Lauren had just finished his final pre-flight checks. It was the early hours of the morning, and the sun had yet to peak over the horizon. He suspected that any minute now his passengers would be arriving to load up onto the shuttle that would transport them off-world. He had come here with only a small crew, a co-pilot, Oliver, and an engineer, Matt. His engineer was just finishing up his own pre-flight checks, while the co-pilot stepped out to keep an eye on any foot traffic in the area. The shuttle port had been eerily quiet, which wasn't necessarily unexpected given how early in the morning it was, but Lar hadn't seen a single patrol walk by in the past few hours. Something about that didn't sit right with him. He hoped it was just paranoia, but he wouldn't take any chances. Matt stepped off the shuttle and declared that they were ready for takeoff as soon as the passengers arrived. At least, that was one less thing to worry about. The moment of relief was unfortunately short-lived, though, as he saw his co-pilot enter the hangar. He kept nervously looking over his shoulder like he was expecting someone to pop up at any moment. What is it? I just saw a flock of armed Bregs step out of Hangar D. Bregs? Tix didn't mention any Ligon presence. If that wasn't reason enough to be worried, they're heading this way. Shit. All right, get yourselves out of sight. I'll speak to our guests. Back me up if things get violent. His two cohorts nodded and moved to take cover behind the shuttle. Lar casually leaned against the other side of the shuttle, pretending he wasn't expecting any trouble. His heart rate elevated with each agonizing second before the aforementioned Bregs stepped into the hangar. There were five of them, and their demeanor was certainly aggressive. They walked in like they owned the place and sized up every corner of the room. One of them fixed Lar with a sneering look and approached him. Can I help you, gentlemen? As a matter of fact, you can. We need you to hand over the artifact right now. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know. He cut himself off when the other four raised their weapons and aimed them at him. He raised his hands in defense. Just so we're clear on the matter, we're not after you, Warian. We're here for the Breg and the humans that you were hired to get off-world. Give us them and the artifact, and you're free to depart. Well, that is a generous offer. But I'm afraid the artifact is with them, and they haven't arrived yet. If you stick around, I'm sure it won't be long until they get here. He tried to sound as friendly and cooperative as possible. The Breg nodded. I'm sure you won't mind if my boys check out your shuttle. Just in case, you understand. Lar cleared his throat. Of course. 
Search whatever you need to. The Breg approached Lar and removed the handgun resting at his hip. He then ordered two of his men to check inside the shuttle for any hidden passengers or cargo, while ordering the other two to check around the side of the shuttle. And suddenly time was of the utmost essence. Lar knew his crew would open fire the moment they were confronted with the two Bregs. And now that he was unarmed, he would have no way of defending himself once the shooting started. Beth and Lena dragged their luggage along the paved path into the shuttle port. Beth had made sure to arm herself in case they encountered any unwanted attention. A plasma rifle was strapped to her back, and a pistol sat at her hip. Hopefully she wouldn't need to use either one. The rear gate to the port had been unlocked, just as Tix had promised. They navigated the back alleys of the port, keeping an eye out for nighttime patrols as they went. Their destination was only around the corner when they received a message on their VIX. A text from Tix stopped them dead in their tracks. Eyes on five bregs in Hangar B. Hang back. Might get bloody. Beth immediately felt an overwhelming sense of dread overtake her. Bregs meant the Ligons had gotten involved. Their arrival meant that something had gone wrong. They were found out. They had to be. Beth shared a look with Lena and could tell she had come to the same conclusion. The two of them had stopped behind the neighboring hangar. Hangar B was right around the corner. They were so close. Letting curiosity get the better of her, she crept around the side and took a peek at Hangar B. She couldn't see inside from the angle she was at, but she could hear voices. Just so we're clear on the matter, we're not after you, Warian. We're here for the Breg and the humans that you were hired to get off-world. Give us them and the artifact, and you're free to depart. Well, that is a generous offer. But I'm afraid the artifact is with them, and they haven't arrived yet. If you stick around, I'm sure it won't be long until they get here. Lauren. That was Lauren's voice. At least he was still alive. Whether or not he was being sincere about turning them over to the Ligons was a matter she could worry about later. Right now, it was obvious he needed help. But where the hell was Tix? Another message came up on her Vic. I told you to hang back. Frustrated, Beth messaged him back. Where are you? The other side of the runway. Got a view inside, B. Can cover Lar if it pops off. Beth looked around in the general area for any sign of Tix, but was unable to locate him. Those black feathers must have been doing wonders for his camouflage. She started typing another message. If the shooting starts, I'm heading in there. Is there a reason you're so dead set on this artifact? Lar asked the Breg, holding him at gunpoint. Keep your mouth shut, War Yen. This is none of your business. Sorry, I'm just curious is all. Then be less curious. You're lucky to still be drawing breath. A gunshot and a scream were heard on the other side of the shuttle. It had happened. The two Bregs ran into Lar's crew, and someone had fired. It all happened too fast to even react. Another shot rang out from outside the hangar, and the Breg standing in front of him had his brains splattered across the concrete floor. Lar silently thanked whatever guardian angel was watching over him as he dove to the floor for cover. Several more shots rang out around the hangar as he crawled to the Breg's body and relieved him of his weapon. Though by the time he'd managed to arm himself, the battle was already over. Beth hugged the wall right next to the open hangar door. One shot rang out from inside the hangar, prompting Tix to shoot the Breg closest to Lauren. Beth poked her head around the corner, weapon at the ready. She heard several more shots ring out from behind the shuttle, but her attention was immediately drawn to the two Bregs quickly exiting the shuttle's interior. She made quick work of the first one, putting four rounds into his chest. The second one received a flurry of shots from both Beth and Tix. He hit the ground hard, leaving no doubt that he wasn't getting back up. Beth noticed Lar scrambling to remove the gun from the first Breg that Tix shot, not even realizing that the immediate threats had been taken care of. Beth was still mounted against the wall, leaving most of her body shielded from incoming fire. She held her gaze on the shuttle, awaiting any threats that might emerge from behind it. Lar seemed to be following suit, though he was far more exposed due to the lack of cover inside the hangar. You two alive back there? I am. The voice of a man responded. Matt's dead, but so are the Bregs. Damn it. Lar whispered to himself. We're clear out here. The war yen stood up and looked back at the hangar door to meet Beth's eyes. She lowered her weapon and entered the hangar. You have impeccable timing. Sorry we weren't here earlier. She replied as she watched Lars' co-pilot drag the body of the engineer onto the shuttle. 
What the hell happened? Ligons from the looks of it. He gestured to the body of one of the Bregs. They knew about the artifact, and they knew about all of you. Beth knelt down to search the Bregs Vic for any information. During that time, both Lena and Tix made their way into the hangar. We need to leave. They may have backup on the way. How did they find out about this? I have no clue. As Beth was looking through the Bregs Vic, she found a picture of herself. The hell? Her words drew the attention of the others. She scrolled to the next image and it was a picture of Lena, then Gabe, then Priscilla, then Lauren. No picture of Tix. Beth looked up at him accusingly. What is this, Tix? I had nothing to do with this, Beth. Then how do they know who we are, Tix? Why do they have pictures of all of us, but not you? Because they know who I am, Beth. They don't need one. Stop and use your head for a second. They were looking for Tix too, Miss Meyer. They said so themselves. Logan must have pieced it together. That's not possible. He seemed to have his suspicions, sure, but there's no way he could have figured out our plan to this minute detail. Unless one of you got sloppy. We weren't sloppy, Tix. God damn it, where are Gabe and Priscilla? I haven't heard from them. We're not leaving without them. Maybe they'll show up if we just give it a few minutes. We're not leaving that to chance. I'm calling them. She tapped her Vic and scrolled to her contacts. She tried calling Gabe first. She listened to the ring-back tone play over and over again. Come on, pick up. Please pick up. But he didn't, and Beth felt her heart drop. She quickly scrolled back to his name and tried calling again. She listened to the ring-back tone for several seconds before she was met with the same outcome. Silence. Damn it! She scrolled over to Priscilla's name this time and tried calling her instead. She was met with the same result. Beth looked up at the others and they all shared the same worried look. Before they had time to say anything, Beth's Vic began ringing. It was Priscilla. She was calling back. Beth tapped the answer icon and relief flooded her entire body. Priscilla? Beth? Something sounded wrong in Priscilla's voice. Beth could tell immediately that she was in a state of distress. What's wrong? They're here, Beth. Logan's guys are here. I'm barricaded in my apartment and they're trying to get in. Shit. We just got attacked at the hangar. Where's Gabe? I, I don't know. He never showed up. I woke up when I heard shooting outside and when I looked out the window, I saw them heading this way. Beth didn't like the sound of that. Her mind flooded with negative thoughts of what the shooting could have been, but she pushed them aside and took a steadying breath. Okay, Priscilla, stay there. I'm coming to get you. Please hurry. I don't know how long I have until they get in. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. You're staying in that shuttle until I get back. I can help them. I'm not arguing about this. I'll go with her instead. No, if Logan found out about this, then the defense tower will shoot us down the second we try to leave. You know the layout better than these two. She pointed to Lar and his co-pilot. It only takes two guys to operate. Kill them and come back here. She moved to address the war yen. Lauren, this is your shuttle. Stay here for now, but duck out if someone comes here looking for trouble. You should also check out the ride the Ligons rode in on. If you install their ID tag onto your shuttle, we'll show up as friendly on their radar until we get out of system. Lauren nodded. Certainly. Send your co-pilot with Tix. Surely you don't intend on going after Priscilla by yourself. I'll be fine. Priscilla! Tix spoke into Beth's Vic. How many of Logan's enforcers are there? I'm not sure. I, I saw at least five. Tix looked back at Beth. You have five to deal with. I have two. You need the backup more. I can handle the defense tower on my own. Beth sighed. Fine. She looked at the co-pilot. What's your name? Oliver. Oliver, stay close and keep up. We're getting Priscilla and Gabe out of this bullshit, if it's the last thing we do. She looked back at Lar. I'm trusting you to guard the most valuable thing on this planet. You sure you can handle this? Don't worry, Miss Meyer. The artifact is in safe hands. I wasn't talking about the artifact. Lar quickly glanced over at Lena, then back at Beth. He gave her a look of realization. She won't come to harm. Good. She turned around to exit the hangar. Let's go, Oliver. She heard the footsteps of the co-pilot rush to catch up with her. Beth retraced her steps back to the rear gate of the shuttle port, and the two of them began jogging in the direction of Serenia, Priscilla and Gabe's hometown. It was only a couple of miles away, but getting there on foot could take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how hard they pushed themselves. And given Priscilla's current predicament, every second counted. Beth switched the audio on her Vic from the speaker to her earpiece and kept Priscilla on the line, keeping herself updated on the progress of the men trying to break into Priscilla's apartment. According to her, she took the heaviest furniture and used it to barricade the front door. 
She covered one window with a bookshelf and another with a wardrobe. And now she was watching the door from a makeshift defensive position she constructed with the remaining furniture. At least if they managed to get through the door, she'd be able to funnel them into a kill zone. That was the hope anyway. But if Beth and Oliver could get there quickly enough, she wouldn't have to worry about firing a shot. It took them 11 minutes to reach the town and one more to reach Priscilla's apartment. Make no mistake, this wasn't the fancy type of apartment building you'd find on Earth. It was more of a makeshift housing unit built on top of an old workshop. The owner of the building used it to work on farming equipment until he decided to dip his hands into real estate. Beth doubted he would be too happy about the shootout that was about to occur in his building. Beth and Oliver ducked between the alleys, trying to avoid the light of the street lamps. They halted when they had a view of the apartment building right across the street. The workshop's garage doors were open, but the lights were off inside. Beth couldn't see any movement inside or outside of the building. Knowing that the clock was ticking, Beth took the lead and quickly crossed the street. She pressed herself against the wall of the building right next to one of the open garage doors. She cautiously leaned her head to look inside, but she couldn't see nor hear anything. She activated the flashlight on her rifle and scanned the dark room. A tool cart and mobile workbench sat near the center of the room. Further in, she could see strange black pieces of metal. It looked like the mobile barricades that they kept in the armory, essentially a deployable shield that you could drop down whenever you had no cover in a firefight. Her light gleamed over the room until it landed on a pool of red. She caught a glimpse of a body on the floor. Before she could even question who it was, a flash of movement caught her eye. Something moved behind the shield. Then several shots rang out. Beth flinched back as she felt something bounce off the shoulder piece of her armor. She ducked back behind the wall as several projectiles ricocheted off the object she was using for cover. They were waiting for her. They had deployed the mobile barricades and prepared for an ambush. They almost took her head off for the trouble. She had bumped her Vic in the process and accidentally hit the end call button with Priscilla. Beth looked back at Oliver and motioned for him to move around the side of the building. There were two ways to get to Priscilla's front door. One was straight through the workshop and up the stairs on the interior of the building. The second was up the stairs on the exterior. They couldn't rush straight through the workshop, not while those enforcers had such a good defensive position. So she would send Oliver around to flank them while she kept them focused on her. Oliver agreed with the idea and made a move toward the stairs, but stopped when his shoulder was suddenly grabbed by Beth. Somehow, over the deafening roar of gunfire, Beth was able to make out the sound of footsteps approaching from the exterior stairs. It seemed the enforcers had the same idea as her. That's what happens when your enemy is trained in the same tactics as you. Combat was a deadly game of chess where outmaneuvering your opponent was a crucial component if you wanted to come out alive. Beth repositioned herself at the corner of the building with Oliver behind her, prepared to swing wide. Beth peeked around the corner first, firing blindly up the stairs. Oliver was quick to swing with her, getting a better angle for more precise shots. There were two of them, both armored and wearing helmets. Beth hit the first one in the legs, causing him to tumble down the stairs. Oliver shot the second one in both the head and neck. His helmet must have deflected the shot to the head because he was still conscious enough to gurgle on the blood filling up his throat. He also came stumbling down the stairs. Oliver put several more shots in him on the way down. He was most certainly dead by the time he reached the bottom. In the meanwhile, Beth was finishing off the first guy with three shots to the head. She wanted to make sure she penetrated the helmet. They didn't take any time to rest, though. They quickly ducked around the corner of the building as one of the enforcers inside the workshop attempted to take advantage of their momentary distraction. He fired several shots from the open garage door, but Beth and Oliver had already ducked behind cover. Beth returned fire, causing the enforcer to retreat back inside. At this point, the original plan was back on. Oliver rushed up the exterior stairs and opened the door to the interior stairwell. Beth kept suppressing fire on the open garage door to keep their attention on her. She pushed up to the garage door and blindly fired inside. She bought Oliver enough time to reach the bottom of the stairs into the workshop. He fired on one of the enforcers, causing him to drop dead in his tracks. Unfortunately, this caught the attention of the other two. 
They both turned their weapons on Oliver. The projectiles tore through him and he fell to the floor. Beth turned the corner the second she heard Oliver fire his weapon. She was quick to shoot one of them, but the other turned quick enough to trade shots with her. Her shot hit him in a gap in his armor on his shoulder. He flinched in pain, which threw off his accuracy. Beth, on the other hand, was shot somewhere in her abdomen. It felt as if someone had punched her in the stomach. She flinched as well, but her accuracy didn't waver. She delivered several more shots to his chest. Then he fell like those before him. Beth kept her rifle up even as the gunfire turned to silence. Adrenaline was pumping through her veins and she refused to let her guard down for even a second. As the seconds passed and her heart rate evened out, she came to two realizations. The first one being that she had just been shot. She suddenly began to internally panic as she scrambled to look at where the projectile had hit her. Her hand brushed against the armored plate covering her abdomen, and she breathed a sigh of relief when she realized it had been deflected. Then came the second realization. Oliver had yet to move. He laid on the floor motionless, and Beth felt a sudden wave of guilt wash over her for not rushing to his aid sooner. She ran over to him and checked for a pulse. Nothing. She'd met him less than 15 minutes ago, and he gave his life to help her rescue one of her friends. And she definitely wouldn't have survived that firefight without him. She couldn't help but feel responsible for what happened. She muttered an apology to him as she stood up. It dawned on her that she wouldn't even be able to bring his body back to Larin. Her carelessness had turned this place into his tomb. She tried to block out the thoughts that started to flood her mind. Thoughts that this was a person with friends and family that would never get to bury him. That he only died because they had gotten careless and given Logan enough clues to uncover their plan. Unfortunately, empathy wasn't so easy to shake off. Beth flipped on the lights to finally allow her to see the interior of the building. She was surrounded by corpses on all sides. The workshop was a bloodbath. A third realization had suddenly crept its way into her head. She had spotted a body on the floor before the shooting had even started. It had kicked off so fast that she didn't even have a chance to get a good look at it. She walked back over to where she spotted it earlier, and with the lights on, she could tell it was a man laying face down on the floor. His face was obscured from her angle, but she could see that he had black hair. And he was wearing armor that looked way too similar to what Gabe was wearing the night before. No, 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 no. She rushed to his side and got a look at his face. Her heart dropped. She felt sick. Tears welled up in her eyes and her knees buckled beneath her. In that moment, her worst fears had been realized. Gabe had two holes in the back of his head, and he was laying in a pool of his own blood. She didn't know what to do, how to react. She rolled him over to look at his face. His lifeless eyes stared back at her. She held him close, caking herself in his blood as she muffled her wails into his shoulder. Please, please don't do this. She closed her eyes and begged for it to be a nightmare. Begged to wake up in her bed. Begged for death to take her before it took a single one of her friends. But none of it mattered. This wasn't a dream. It was brutal, unrelenting reality. What Logan had warned her about was coming true. The galaxy would take everything from her if she let it. She refused to let it take any more. Poor Priscilla was probably still upstairs, wondering if the quiet was a good or bad sign. Beth couldn't save Gabe, but she could still save Priscilla. She pressed her forehead against his one last time and muttered an apology for him just like she did for Oliver. The pain she felt for the co-pilot was a slight sting. The pain she felt for Gabe was as if a part of her soul had been forcefully torn from her. Empathy wasn't so easy to shake off. She breathed in Gabe's scent and caught the smell of the Bregian brandy they had shared the night before. She looked to the side and saw a broken glass sitting just out of reach. She was a grief-stricken mess at that moment, but the alarm bells still started going off in her head. Priscilla said he had never made it to her place. She said that she was awoken by gunshots from outside and saw them walking towards her building. Was she mistaken? Was she just simplifying the story to get the information out as quickly as possible? Beth shook those thoughts from her head. She had to focus on the here and now, and she needed to carry on for Gabe's sake. She gently laid his head back down on the floor. Her body was still shaking and her face was a mess of tears and sweat. But she was alive. 
She pushed herself to stand back up and turn to the stairs with a newfound sense of purpose. She made her way to the second floor of the building to a hallway that led to Priscilla's door. She pounded on it with her fist and announced herself to Priscilla. A few seconds later, she heard footsteps approaching the door. After it clicked a few times, it was finally opened by Priscilla. She looked disheveled, like she hadn't gotten any sleep the night before, and she smelled of alcohol. How the hell did you survive that? Priscilla asked with genuine shock on her face. I shouldn't have. Oliver gave his life for mine. Shit. So it's just us, unless you saw any sign of Gabe. Beth faltered a moment before she could speak. He's... he's downstairs, Priscilla, with two holes in the back of his fucking skull. Priscilla's face dropped and she leaned against the wall for support. No. Fuck, I knew this would happen. This is exactly why I didn't want to do this. Does this really seem like the appropriate time for I told you so? What else am I supposed to say? I told you this was a terrible idea, but you and Gabe just couldn't help yourselves, could you? All for this ridiculous fantasy. Priscilla retreated into her apartment, but Beth stayed hot on her heels, fury building up inside of her. Fantasy. I'm sorry if wanting to give us all a better life wasn't worth it in your eyes. Would you stop pretending that you were doing any of this for my benefit? If you wanted what was best for me, you would have left this alone. Are you kidding me? I dropped everything to come here for you. I spilled a river of blood downstairs for you. If Oliver hadn't come with me, I would have died for you. Where the fuck is any of this coming from? You don't always know what's best for other people, Beth. You want to protect Lena? Give her a better life? There's no better life out there. It's all a different variation of shit. We were a part of something here. Something that could have been meaningful. But now you've ruined any chance we have of... Priscilla cut herself off to take a breath. She evened herself out and continued. This mattered to me. She gestured to her apartment. And you didn't even give a second thought to pulling me away from it. Beth felt her anger start to spiral into guilt. Had she really been so careless, so inconsiderate, that she hadn't even noticed how much Priscilla didn't even want this? Her gaze traveled around Priscilla's apartment, and suddenly she felt more alarm bells going off. The makeshift barricade Priscilla had supposedly created was nowhere to be seen. In fact, her furniture appeared to all be in the same place it normally was. Then dangerous questions began to enter her mind. Why were the enforcers waiting for her downstairs as if they had known she was coming? Why did it look like Gabe had been shot when his guard was down? Why was Priscilla's door completely intact without any signs of them trying to force it down? Why did she say that she had heard shots from outside the building, but Gabe's body was inside? And then Beth's eyes reached the kitchen. Sitting on one of the countertops was the final nail in the coffin. It was an empty bottle of Bregian brandy, the same bottle she had shared with Gabe. Priscilla followed her gaze, and Beth swore she had never seen the redhead so nervous. You said Gabe never showed up. Beth stated cautiously, her hand reaching for the sidearm at her hip. He didn't. She was trying to play it off. Poorly, Beth was losing herself in realization. An image flashed in her mind of Gabe and Priscilla sharing a drink. Priscilla shoots him in the head as soon as he turns around. A look of horror adorned Beth's face. No. Beth, what are you doing? It was you. You told Logan. What? I, Beth, that's insane. Priscilla's movements were subtle, but Beth could tell her hand was moving to the weapon on her own hip. She had never felt so betrayed in all her life. You got me out here so they would kill me. Stop and listen to me. You're being paranoid. So, let's cool off for a second and then get the hell out of here before any more enforcers show up. You gonna put two in the back of my head as soon as I turn around? I would never do that to you. Beth watched as Priscilla's hand gripped onto her sidearm. Because you'd rather shoot me in the front. I'm not shooting you, Beth. Please, please don't pull that fucking gun on me. The two women stared at each other, both waiting for the other to make the first move. Priscilla jerked her sidearm from its holster and managed to get a single shot off before taking one to her stomach. For the second time that morning, Beth felt a punch to the abdomen. But this time, she felt the blood trickle down her stomach. The plate didn't block this one, but that didn't stop her. Priscilla yelped in pain as she stumbled back into the wall. She attempted to raise her weapon back at Beth, but was cut off by a second shot to the stomach. Before she knew it, Beth had grabbed the gun in her hand and attempted to wrestle it from her grip. When she refused to let go, Beth bashed her own gun against Priscilla's skull until she released it. Priscilla slid to the floor unceremoniously. She felt blood pour down her face, 
Her vision had blurred, and she heard an incessant ringing in her ears for several seconds. When her vision cleared, she looked up to find herself staring down the barrel of Beth's gun. Why the fuck would you do this to us? Priscilla groaned through the painful thumping she felt in both her head and her stomach. She opened her mouth to speak when it finally settled. We're all doing what we can out here, right? This is my, my home, Beth. My community. Another groan. So you told Logan? Tried to get us all killed? No, would have saved Lena. She's too valuable an asset to lose. Uh, but you. <sighs> Logan offered you the keys to the kingdom. A chance to be something. Oh, real. To continue his legacy. His legacy? He runs this place like a mafia. He destroyed the lives of all these people. He saved all of us. <laughs> Life before the fractured was chaos. There was a new warlord running the streets every other week. Good people died every day for no good reason. Logan put a stop to all of that. And replaced it with his own form of tyranny. Even Gabe saw that. Because he was as selfish and short-sighted as you are. This colony it barely gets by as it is. The Alliance doesn't give a shit about us. Logan chose you because he truly believed you would make a real positive impact on us. And now, while we're vulnerable, desperate, in need of allies, you steal our two greatest assets and turn your back on us. If this colony dies, that's on you. Beth shook her head, unable to believe the words coming from Priscilla's mouth. You're as delusional as he is. We were never going to be a sovereign nation. Of course not, because you wanted what was best for Gabe and Lena. I don't know why you'd give up everything for those two. Gabe was always too stupid to see the bigger picture. And Lena? You really think you can preserve her innocence by leaving Aferia? You take her out into the galaxy and she'll be dead in no time. She doesn't have what it takes to survive out there. Beth felt her blood boil. You and I are shitty people, Priscilla. But Gabe would have given his life for both of us in a heartbeat. And Lena? Her parents are dead because of me, but she still treats me like an older sister. The two of them are better friends than either one of us deserve. If you spit on their names one more time, I will blow your fucking head off! Priscilla's face was hard to read, but Beth was sure she saw fear behind her gritted teeth. I guess that's it then. We know where our loyalties lie. Beth shook her head. You're not doing this because you're loyal. You're doing it because you're scared. Even now. Maybe, but I'm not scared of you. You won't pull that trigger. It's not who you are. You might think it's as easy as the twitch of a finger, but when you're aiming that gun at your friend, the weight of that trigger just gets heavier and it heavier. It gets lighter every time you open your fucking mouth. Beth's hands shook, her aim becoming unsteady. Priscilla groaned once more. You don't have to play tough with me. When I had Gabe in my sights, I almost... Priscilla slumped over with a new hole in her forehead. That was for Gabe. And that was for everyone else you hurt, you fucking snake. Beth stared at her dead friend with a look of cold indifference, but on the inside she could feel herself falling apart. Everything they had been through together. Ten years of friendship. Destroyed. Beth groaned as she felt a sudden wave of pain throbbing in her stomach. Right. She had been shot too. She leaned against the wall for support and pulled up her Vic. She gave it a few taps and the ringback tone played in her earpiece. Beth? Beth closed her eyes and gave the universe a quiet, thank you for not taking her too. Hey. Beth said in a hoarse voice. I'm still alive. You guys doing okay? We got ambushed by a group of enforcers, but we took care of them. Lar took a hit to the arm, but he's all right. Tix took care of the defense tower, and I got my hands on the ID tag, so we're all set here. How's Priscilla holding up? Priscilla's lifeless eyes mocked her. Beth's breath hitched in her throat, and in that moment, it felt like time had stopped. Hello? Lena's voice pulled her from her trance. What's wrong? Beth closed her eyes and released a quiet sob. It's just me. I'm the only one left here. What? I couldn't save them. What about Gabe? Lena's voice sounded more frantic. It's j just me, Lena. Beth could hear shifting on the end of the line. Lena's breath became unstable. I'm coming back. We need to get the hell out of here. You're okay, right? Please tell me you're okay. She pulled her hand from her abdomen. It was significantly more bloody than before. I'm bleeding a bit, but I can make it back. If I leave now, I can meet you halfway. No, you're staying on that goddamn shuttle. I can hear it in your voice, Beth. You need help. I swear to f fucking God, I am not arguing about this. Neither am I. I've already lost two friends tonight. I'm not losing you too. A wave of pain shot through Beth. She gritted her teeth and hissed out a breath. Fine. She looked at Priscilla's lifeless form one last time. That image would be burnt into her brain for the rest of her life. She pushed herself off of the wall and headed for the door.
She walked down the stairs and tried her best to ignore the bodies. She didn't want to remember Gabe like that. Tears stung in her eyes as the cool morning air kissed her face. The sun still had yet to breach the horizon, but she was running out of time to utilize the cover of darkness. She navigated the back alleys until she reached the dirt road leading out of town. From there, she began the long walk back to the shuttle port. She went into autopilot. Her legs carried her down the path as her mind was flooded with images of her friends. She tortured herself with the thought that she may have missed the signs. Did she not pay enough attention to Priscilla's behavior? Did she neglect her friend in her most desperate time of need? Was she really so focused on leaving Etheria that she pushed Priscilla away? Even if the answer to all of her questions was yes, she knew it didn't justify Priscilla's actions, murdering Gabe and trying to do the same to her. Beth would never forgive her for that. What was she supposed to tell Lena? That one of their nearly lifelong friends killed the other? That Beth put her down as an act of vengeance? Another wave of pain shot through her and she lost her balance. She fell on her knees into the dirt. Her hand held onto the wound in her abdomen. Her breath was haggard and uneven. She attempted to force herself back onto her feet, but just couldn't muster the strength. The morning had been dragging on for so long, and she was getting so tired. Maybe she should just catch her breath for a second. A warm light gently caressed her face. The sun finally peeked its head over the horizon. The sight was... Well, it was actually quite beautiful. How had she never noticed that about the sunrise until now? She heard rapid footsteps approaching her but didn't bother looking to see who it was. Her attention was too fixed on admiring the gorgeous landscape now that it was illuminated by the alluring light of dawn. The footsteps gradually slowed in pace as they approached, until they eventually came to a complete stop. Beth took a few more seconds to relish in the sight before she finally turned to look at who it was. Lena stood over her, her face a mix of so many emotions. Worry, fear, sadness, relief, all wrapped into one. No words needed to be spoken. A quiet understanding weighed on both of them. Lena released a shuddering breath before a tear dripped from her eye. Before her state could worsen, she rushed Beth and embraced her in a desperate hug. Beth returned the embrace and felt the same desperation. They had lost two pieces of their greater whole and now it was up to them to carry on. What an absolute mess. Lena helped Beth to her feet and offered her a shoulder. She supported her friend all the way to the shuttle port. The bodies of several enforcers laid outside of Hangar B. Lar and Tix were waiting for them. Tix helped Lena drag Beth onto the shuttle. Lauren looked out into the distance, quietly contemplating the loss of his crew before boarding the shuttle alongside them. He sat in the pilot's seat and fired up the engines. All was quiet at the port as the shuttle exited the hangar and made its ascent. As they climbed higher and higher, Lena and Tix removed Beth's armor and worked to clean her wound. Thankfully, it was fairly superficial in spite of what the blood would have had her believe. The shuttle breached the atmosphere without incident, and the ID tag would keep Ligon patrols off their backs until they reached the outbound hyperlane. They had done it. In spite of everything, of all the ways it could have turned out, they survived. Under different circumstances, this would have been cause for celebration, but there was no room for excitement or relief. The atmosphere was quiet, an uncomfortable quiet. No one dared acknowledge anything beyond what was directly in front of them. Lena, Beth, and Tix focused on her injury, while Lauren focused on flying the ship. None of them would dare acknowledge their success, and none of them would dare acknowledge the four empty seats. All that mattered was the task at hand. Addressing anything else would have been opening Pandora's box, and none of them had the strength, the will to deal with the consequences of such an act. Beth couldn't help but think about two words that Lar had said to her the previous day. Two words that signified a change in her life that would last forever. Libertalia awaits.